So uh, tonight's topic, uh, this is actually part two of a discussion on the perfection of patience or Shanti Paramita. And um, well, due to the before aforementioned technical difficulties, we weren't able to have a hybrid version of part one. Um, so luckily they're not too dependent on each other. They're kind of, they divide easily into two parts. So um, <clears throat> we'll just go with it from there and hope that it all works out in the end. So uh, in the first presentation, I kind of explained that I was using Nagarjuna's commentary on the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra as sort of my outline and following the discussion that he has there. That work is somewhat like an encyclopedia of East Asian Buddhism. So there's a lot of information about many different topics. There are two um, substantial chapters on the perfection of patience in that book divided up into the two topics that um, I've addressed, the first one being Sadhvik Shanti and then now Dharma Shanti. So just by way of a little uh, summary of what Shanti Paramita is, um, this is often translated as patience, forbearance, forgiveness, or tolerance. And there are a few other ways that it's been translated. But none of these are really satisfactory as they kind of address components of Tushanti, but not the overall practice or the overall idea. But nonetheless, throughout the presentation, I'm going to go ahead and use the term patience, um, just because that's a very common translation. And when we're talking about Shanti Paramita, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing we normally think about uh, in terms of patience. It's referring specifically to... Uh, the sort of idea of non-movement of the mind, so a kind of imperturbability. <clears throat> and the main two types, as I just mentioned, are the patients with respect to beings, sadhvik shanti, and then the patients with respect to phenomena or dharmas, which is dharmic shanti, and that's the topic for tonight. And the idea is that if you cultivate these two different um, types of shanti, that they'll bring your accomplishments, the deeds that you do, um, in line with your aspiration to awaken to Buddhahood. And the way that this is kind of seen as working is that sadhvika shanti, uh, patience with respect to beings, uh, results in you doing good actions. So there are the consequence of this is that you cultivate merit. Good things happen out in the world. And dharma kashanti is a little bit more subtle. It's more about um, phenomena themselves and. I'm sorry, that means it's going to be a little complicated and um, it'll be a test of your patience. <laughs> but the idea being that this transforms our mind and allows us to cultivate wisdom. So when you combine the two, these are the two requisites that lead to Buddhahood. So if you got both, you will awaken to Buddhahood if you perfect them. So on the topic of Dharma Kishanti, Dharma Shanti refers to being unmoved by our perceptions of phenomena. And the scriptural citation that Nagarjuna uses is um, the end of the Vimala Kirti Sutra, where there are all these high ranking bodhisattvas giving their take on the true nature of phenomena in the world. And they come to Vimala Kirti, and he's the one who's going to end the discussion. And he just remains silent. And Nagarjuna says, This is the perfect example. This guy gets it. So this is, I guess, maybe uh, one way we can think about <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Sorry for everyone in the super study class. We're studying it right now. So if we were to try and classify phenomena or dharmas as they're referred to in Buddhism, they fit into two sort of overarching categories. One of them is non-mental phenomena and the other is mental phenomena. And in the realm of non-mental phenomena, we have uh, what are considered the outward phenomena. And these are things like cold, heat, wind, rain, et cetera, stuff that's like out in the world that we experience. And then the inward phenomena are things like hunger, thirst, aging, sickness, death, these kinds of things, which are more about us in particular, things that we experience. And then the mental dharmas, um, they're divided up into two categories that aren't given nice names, but um, one of these categories is things like hatred, worry, doubt, et cetera. And the other one is more things like unwholesome desire, arrogance, and these kinds of things. But classifying those into the two different categories isn't going to be too important for us tonight. So you might be wondering when you look at that list, why would you need to be patient with things like non-mental dharmas? Like, it rains, it gets hot, so what? 
And the answer that's given is that all of the experiences that we have affect our minds and affect how we respond to other things. So at a certain level, even if there's not an action associated with it on our part, it's still having some effect on us and the other people around us just by nature of the interdependence of ourselves with other people. And so um, in that sense, the example is given that um, we would think about having an attitude of loving kindness toward other people as being in some way a positive thing that somebody is doing. But at the same time, is there a tangible result that you're seeing before they take action based on that belief? And the answer is that, no, you can't really see anything yet. There seems to be something good about it, right? And that's maybe a helpful example. I'm not so sure that it is. <clears throat> so the text has a lot of strategies for trying to cultivate Dharma Kishanti, the patience with respect to phenomena. And it's kind of divided up into patients with these non-mental dharmas. And then we'll talk about patients with the mental dharmas, which is kind of like the big section. So there are a few different ways to think about these things. Um, one of them is to look at the present circumstances you're experiencing in a couple of different ways. The one of the traditional ways is thinking about what you're experiencing now as a sort of karmic debt that you have to pay. And the idea there is that if all things are related through causation, then if something pleasant is happening to me now, maybe it happens because of things that happened before I was even born, or if something negative is happening to me, the same sort of idea. So in other words, it's not something to get upset about because we can't like go back previous lifetimes and change what's happened. So we accept it, we move on. Another way of looking at this is that we can flip it and say that it's actually an opportunity. If we didn't have adverse circumstances, then you would have no way to practice Kashanti and you wouldn't be able to move forward on the Buddhist path in the first place. It's a little self-healthy, but you know, it does work. <laughs> and then sort of the other main way of trying to think about these is um, <clears throat> thinking about the universality of suffering and dissatisfaction. And the first example is that, well, we're people with bodies. And by the nature of how our bodies are constructed, they come from elements out in the universe, outside of ourselves. They come together for a short amount of time. We have to keep them up by drinking water and getting sunlight and eating food and all of these things. So there's kind of a constant maintenance. And eventually they go apart, right? They return to their component pieces and transform into some other form. And that on its own is dissatisfying. That's not a pleasant experience for us. The other one is that um, no matter what sort of social status you have, there's always some form of suffering that you are going to be experiencing or some sort of dissatisfaction. And there's the example of, well, you look at a wealthy person and you think, wow, their life is great. But the thing is, their life becomes characterized by fear of losing what they've attained. And so in that sense, it's like they're always having to look over their shoulders, right? Worried about those things being taken away if they become attached to them. Well, likewise, you could look at somebody who has virtually nothing, and it's obvious to you that they're experiencing material privation and that that's not a pleasant experience either. Well, you could say, ah, oh, these monks have it great. They just hang out in the temple all the time, and they're cutting off all of these, all these hindrances, and they're, they're having a good time. So, uh, But Nagarjuna reminds us that Monastics are choosing to experience privation in their current life now because of the results they believe it will have later. And that likewise, if somebody um, is a householder, they kind of have the opposite. They get to enjoy the home life, having a family, all of these things now, but then in future lifetimes, eventually there's going to be this period of austerity, right? So the point is that nobody really escapes from it. It's something that's universal. And so we shouldn't really get so wound up uh, in the fact that we are experiencing it. This one I enjoy a little bit. Um, is that we should reflect on the fact that pleasure seeking is foolish. You know, these things are impermanent and no matter what pleasure we experience from something, it's momentary and then it's gone again. And I'm sure we've all heard the old adage, you know, you can't take it with you um, when you die. Uh, well, that's basically the, the argument here. So we should keep that in mind when we think about um, what we're doing in our, in our current life. And this could allow us to not be so attached to the, those external circumstances. And then, of course, the last one is sort of an article of faith. It's um, reflecting on the fact that the Buddhist path is a way that we can mitigate that dissatisfaction. And um, <laughs> it, 
the way that it's proposed is that essentially you're dissatisfied no matter what. So would you rather just like be dissatisfied or would you rather be dissatisfied but working toward eliminating that dissatisfaction for yourself and others through the positive actions that you're taking? So this is kind of a way to, you know, remind yourself to calm down and like, this was my goal. This is what I was trying to do. And this moves us on to the bigger category because most of the dharmas are mental since we spend so much of our lives um, in our heads, honestly, is kind of the nature of how we live. And um, one of the first reflections that's listed to help us uh, have some sort of patience with respect to our, our conceptualizations, our thoughts, our emotions, etc., is to keep in mind the fact that we are bodhisattvas. And if we fail to maintain patience with all of the afflictions and the fetters that we have, like all of our sort of disadvantages that we have on the path, then we're basically renouncing what we promised to do in the first place, which was try to find ways to overcome those things on the Bodhisattva path to be able to help others. Additionally, we can think about the fact that Buddhahood is our goal in the end. So that's what we're trying to reach. And there's the story of um, the demon king confronting the Buddha and he says to him, the Buddha's sitting under the Bodhi tree and he's trying to reach awakening. So he's in deep meditation and the demon king Mara comes up to him and he says, basically stop and go home. Your life's about to be real short because I'm going to bring an army of demons and they're going to attack you and kill you. And the Buddha's response is, I'm already in deep meditation and I've conquered all of these afflictions and fetters that I have in my own mind. So there is no external circumstance that you could send that's going to be able to derail my progress. They won't be able to do anything to me. But there's an additional consideration because um, we see ourselves as being on the bodhisattva path, which means that our goal is to um, attain liberation for all living beings through our actions and through our own cultivation, we're doing it for the benefit of other people, not just ourselves. So <laughs> there's a little bit of a soteriological issue here, which is that if we actually try to sever all of these negative mental states that we have to eliminate them through meditative practice, we run into a problem, which is we remove ourselves from the cycle of life and death. We no longer understand the things that other people are experiencing and we have no way to relate to them. And so the recommendation actually is that we don't try to get rid of those afflictions and those fetters. Instead, we try to learn a way that we can um, essentially uh, break their influence over us, but still like let them be there so that we can call on them to be able to relate to other people as we need to. And there are several sort of examples of how we can do this. One of those is using right thought uh, from the Eightfold Path, which is essentially bringing our way of thinking in line with Buddhist teachings. Another one of those is contemplating uh, emptiness and impermanence. So in other words, understanding that all of the things that we experience come together through causal processes, and they don't really have independent selves from each other. They're all in a relationship to each other all the time. And then on top of that, that they're always changing. So there's not really something that we can grasp onto. If we're dissatisfied right now, we can basically wait a minute. Additionally, we can do good deeds, cultivating merit. And the idea here is that it's believed that the more good deeds that you do, the more flexible and the softer your mind gets in a positive way, the softer your mind gets, where you sort of just get less bothered by things. There's, there's a sort of reciprocal relationship between the things that you do and the state of your mind. So by doing good things, your mental state improves as well. And that gives you sort of more resilience. The one for wisdom I particularly enjoy, which is if we can cultivate wisdom to be able to understand how phenomena work, then uh, we can see our fetters and afflictions as being like thieves. And instead of sentencing them all to execution, which seems like maybe a little bit of a harsh sentence, instead we can just tie them up and keep them over here where they're not stealing from us. I like the analogy. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is cultivating reality-based awareness. And this is... Um, seeing that when we look at our fetters and hindrances, 
we see them as being harmful or evil or these kinds of things, and we see meritorious activities as just being good by their very nature. But this isn't necessarily true. It's not something about those things that makes them that way. It's how we understand them. And so from that perspective, uh, we don't have to be attached to the good deeds that we do. We can say, well, it's not that it's good as such. And we can say the same thing about um, things that cause us um, dissatisfaction. We can say that, well, it's not really those things as such. It's the way that I'm understanding and perceiving them. Now we're going to get a little bit out into outer space. So we talk a lot about the fact that we're always looking at non-duality, right? It's very important in Mahayana Buddhism. Well, you can play a little bit of games with numbers, and this is kind of one of the ways that you can break yourself out of your ways of thinking about things, your habitual ways of thinking about them, and allow yourselves to take a different perspective. So on one hand, we can look at all phenomena and we can say that there are things about them that are the same. The fact that we perceive them in some way with our minds and our sense organs, the fact that we can make statements, uh, knowledge statements about them, we can like know them. Um, and there are several other ways you can do this. There are probably uncountable ways if you really want to go that route. But the idea is that you can find ways in which they're all unified. And in a sense, they're all sort of permutations of one thing. So really all the dharmas are just one thing. But we all know that that's not really true. I mean, we divide things into subject and object. We divide them into existent and non-existent and all kinds of dualistic conceptions, good and bad, all of these things. And so we can see something that's singular also as something that's dual. But we can also see it as something that's triple. For instance, in Tendai, we have the threefold truth of ultimate reality, conventional reality, and the middle way between the two. And you can play this game with four, five, six, any number that you want. But the strategy here is to take some category that you have, some way of thinking that you have, and to look at how you can divide it a different way and come to a different conclusion about it. And the fact is, these are the ways that we're thinking about something. So it's really up to us. We can be creative in that respect. But uh, looking at them in terms of numerical categories is one of the strategies that's recommended. Then there's kind of a series of additional factors that are maybe a little bit more advanced. And these involve the three seals of the Dharma, which we covered in some depth last time, but in brief, it's the fact that things are characterized by impermanence, by not having an independent self or their interdependence with all other things. And that we can also have the experience of quiescence, which is what Nirvana is characterized by. And so by keeping these things in mind, we can apply those whenever we're having some sort of, we're experiencing some sort of mental disturbance. Additionally, there's something called the 14 difficult questions. And these are questions about, uh, they're existential questions about the nature of reality, what things really are, et cetera, et cetera, existence, non-existence, all of these things. And the Buddha famously addressed um, the issue of metaphysical speculation with the analogy of the poison arrow which is a story of, you know, imagine you get shot with a poisoned arrow, but you refuse to let the doctor remove it until he can tell you who made the arrow, who made the poison, what plants they use to make the poison, on and on and on and on. Well, you'll die before you get the arrow taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so his point is we need to focus on the more immediate issues. We need to focus on um, trying to relieve our dissatisfaction in the here and now with Buddhist teachings, as opposed to spending a bunch of time speculating on things that might not even have answers. Well, the recommendation for bodhisattvas is just kind of accept it. I mean, we understand that those questions might not actually have answers no matter how far we try to investigate them. So the way of moving beyond that quandary, beyond our existential doubt, is instead just to say, you know, we don't know. It seems pretty simple, right? Now, getting a little more hairy, and it's where we're going next, is trying to understand the nature of dharmas. So really trying to, trying to understand what we can about phenomena themselves. And you get into some very subtle exercises here, but uh, I'll do my best to try and make it not too confusing, but that's where we're going next. And then um, 
Well, finally, we have uh, the aspiration for awakening or what we talk about as, uh, as bodhicitta. And this is to keep in mind, uh, again, that as bodhisattvas, we're seeking after awakening and wanting to act on, uh, wanting to act for the benefit of others. So that should be what's serving as our motivation. And with that as our motivation, it should be a pretty powerful way for us to be willing to cultivate patience and not get so upset about those existential questions and our sort of mental afflictions. So it's kind of a step back and look at the big picture. Why are you here? <clears throat> and now for the moment, I'm sure we've all been waiting for. Yeah. So this is a huge topic and they kind of throw this discussion in like we should all be able to follow along. And I admit it's a little bit difficult. So my recommendation is um, maybe allow yourself some poetic license in your understanding of what's going on here and try not to treat these so much as like logical arguments. The purpose behind this sort of um, narrative about the true nature of dharmas and these different ways of looking at them is to make it where there's no one perspective that we can settle down in and become attached to. So the idea is to kind of have us where we can move between those because the, the idea is to liberate us from our habitual ways of thinking, but also keep us free from falling into just a new habitual way of thinking. Please don't like put yourself off into the other universe. We're going to get to how that's like not where we're trying to go with this. Like you do need to be functional in the world at the end. And the goal is to make it easier for you to function when you have those sorts of difficulties and hindrances in your ability to think through things. So we start from the fact that all of these phenomena that we interact with and that we experience throughout our lives, they're pure by nature. From the very beginning, that's true of them. So one of the issues that we have is we kind of try to think our way out of them and their influence, or we try to eliminate them with discursive thought. But that's not really something that can be done. One of the strategies that we use in Buddhism is something that's called the tetralemma. And for those who aren't familiar, just very briefly, it's an argument structure that's used all throughout um, Buddhist shastra and sutras, commentaries and sutras. And it basically follows, you take a dualistic conception and you say the first position is accepting that thing. The second one is accepting the opposite of it. The third is accepting the thing and its opposite. And the fourth is accepting neither. And then you sort of look at what contradictions boil up from them. So for example, looking at existential questions about dharmas, dharmas exist could be point one. Dharmas do not exist being point two. Three would be that they both exist and do not exist. And then four would be that they neither exist nor do not exist. And the thought would be that if these are all the permutations that you can have, that one of them has to be correct. <clears throat> but what I mean by saying that the tetralemma is not true is that none of these options are correct. And that's the point of the exercise. You should go through it and you see that no matter which of these two positions you take and then extending those these four positions, none of them actually make sense. They all have contradictions inherent in them. And in that sense, uh, we're asked to remember that actually the tetralemma is... Um, considered a therapeutic tool, if you will, in that when we have a sort of issue in how we're thinking about something, we can use the tetralemma to break ourselves out of it. But we're not really here to master the tetralemma. The tetralemma leads us to the fact that all of the views that we can have are approximations. They don't really fit the reality that we live in. And there are reasons for this, right? Um, one of them is that the views that we have um, are the result of some conditions in the world and our consciousness, our perception of those things, and then our attempt to sort of conceptualize them and make sense of them. So by their very nature, they're always incomplete. They don't correspond with the reality. There's something that arose from that reality in a way. So what we wanna do is train ourselves to be able to counteract any possible view while still not losing our faith in the purity and indestructibility of Buddhist teachings, right? So we're doing it for that goal. We don't want to just like destroy everything. So from here, we're sort of asked to look at the erroneousness of taking extreme views. And I gave you an example of dharmas existing, not existing. And this is one of the common ones. Um, 
the tendency to think in terms of existence versus non-existence. But the issue is that both of these views seem to be sort of paradoxical because the things that we see as existent change. And sometimes they change and they become non-existent. And they can't really be both. It seems sort of contradictory. But then at the same time, uh, there are things that we believe are non-existent, but they're non-existent in distinction from being existent. So it sort of implies that at some point we could imagine an existence of those non-existent things. So it's like the categories sort of already are a little bit difficult. This is one way that you can think of them. Another thing to consider is the fact that um, we tend to name things. So we experience something, we separate it out from the larger sphere of our experience and we give a name to it. And by doing that, we impute a sort of existence onto it. So a lot of times when we're talking about things existing, that's what we really mean. But in following that trail, that means that these things don't necessarily have a, a clear existence. And the reality is that those phenomena that we're naming are actually changing all the time. And I think this is kind of a strange example, but you know, sure, maybe it helps uh, that we have this thing that we separate out and we call it water and water is characterized by being liquid, et cetera. But you know, under certain conditions, water becomes a solid. And it seems weird to call the solid thing water and we have a different name for it that's ice, but we understand that it's the same thing kind of. And you already start to get into like some messiness just with like simple things like that. But then when we're trying to look at like huge metaphysical questions, we kind of have the same issues. And it's a little bit hard to really um, get at the bottom of these things because we're the ones who are imputing that existence on them. And we're kind of making them up as we go in some sense. <clears throat> and this leads to the fact that no matter what dharmas we try to look at, there seems to be this um, sense of unreality about them. And there are many different techniques that can be used to try and explore this. Um, one of them is trying to take a moment in time, snapping your fingers, and divide that into 60 units of time. And then think about a thought that you have and how that fits within that period of time and then within that 60 seconds. And through doing this contemplation, the idea is that you realize that from one moment to the next, thoughts are like stream, a stream of water or like the flickering of a flame. They're constantly like coming and going. Well, are they existent or non-existent? And the conclusion that at least some of these exegetes came to is that we seem to have a moment where they're simultaneously both, the more if we just keep subdividing time which is sort of contradictory. And it points to this notion of a sort of unreality there when we're thinking in terms of existing versus non-existing. And they believe that it actually fits better to maybe say that that's not how we should consider them. We should think about existence and non-existence as being sort of a shorthand. And that really what we experience is kind of something beyond fitting in either category. It sort of has components of both. And yet at the same time, it doesn't make sense to say that it's both. <clears throat> so then this gets us back to our old friends, existence and non-existence. And there are a lot of arguments that you can find in the literature for, um, for trying to refute these things. And sometimes they're very frustrating. But when we're talking about something like uh, things that are seen as eternally existent, which is a category that, you know, things like space, time, the soul, directions, uh, in Buddhism, Dharma nature and suchness, ultimate reality, other categories. These things are in some way considered to be eternally existent. But the reality is that the more we think about this, we find a lot of contradictions in them. And so we shouldn't actually continue to make that um, sort of distinction and believe that there are these eternally existing categories. Yet at the same time, you can't deny time, space, suchness, all of these things. And so in that sense, the attitude that we should take is being able to accept the fact that there are multiple ways of looking at it. The same is true for trying to look at non-existent things, essentially. And if we sort of propose that there are truly non-existent things, um, this basically ends up breaking causation, which is a major part of <laughs> Buddhism in the first place. And then the Four Noble Truths, the foundational Buddhist teaching no longer makes sense 
as well as things like the Eightfold Path, which is part of the Four Noble Truths, the Three Treasures, et cetera, et cetera. And you just have a word or a world where causation doesn't really exist anymore. And we like to sort of look at this idea of emptiness, right? We say, well, we don't have to say they exist or they don't exist. They're empty. They don't have a substantial self and they're coming together through that interdependence of everything. So if we have the whole net, then things work. But if one, one piece is missing, then it's all comes apart. But we're also told that even just accepting emptiness, emptiness itself isn't true. And what this means is that there's a tendency to just say, well, emptiness is the ultimate reality. And we're cautioned not to do that. We should instead hold in mind <coughs> that emptiness <coughs> is true of causal processes. And yet at the same time, emptiness is also empty. And therefore we can't accept emptiness as an ultimate truth. We just have no ultimate truths in that sense. We have to move beyond the notion of an ultimate truth. And this is just another way of trying to break yourself out of getting really rigidly locked into that sort of um, metaphysical view. So we're getting close. The six bases of Dharmic Shanti, and those are on your handout as well, um, are sort of six strategies that we can use and maybe a little more clear than that whole story about the true nature of dharmas. So the first thing is we can understand the true character of the middle way. And this isn't the middle way bet between two extremes in the way that we think of, you know, between hedonism and asceticism or something like that in early Buddhism. This is with respect to our view of existence and non-existence. And so if we take a middle way, we say we don't have to accept either one. Seems fine. Well, that's an example of a practice of patience with respect to dharmas. We refuse to settle down into either one. Our mind remains unmoved by the problem of existence versus non-existence. Additionally, we can use meditation as a strategy. And meditation allows our minds to become um, more pliant, but also it purifies them. And what this allows us to do is not intellectualize phenomena. Instead, we can sort of have an intuitive experience of them or, or resonate with them if you, if you like that way of thinking about it. And this, again, leads us to a sense of comfort in that we feel some understanding of reality without needing a discursive explanation for it. This is probably the simplest one, acquiescence, which is that we can think about our assumptions about the things in the world, and we can realize that our assumptions and conceptualizations are malleable and fleeting, and that the things that we're trying to un understand with them are ultimately unobtainable. So we can just kind of accept it. Now, the realization of wisdom involves contemplating our responses to dharmas. And the idea here is that we think about the fact that when we experience something, we almost immediately jump to thinking about it in terms of opposites or its relation to something else. And so through looking at that investigation, um, what we can do is instead apply the lenses of the ideas of emptiness, that total inter interdependence of all things, the fact that the phenomena we experience are impermanent and those two things sort of weaken our attachment to those ways of seeing. And that's just one more strategy that can, you can use. And then there's the direct contemplation of emptiness. And this is what I was warning about, which is not settling down into emptiness and saying, well, I've got it. It's all just empty and relative because the goal is to be able to help other people and to improve the world, right? Improve our lives, the lives of other people. So we don't really just want to settle down into a total moral relativism and like everything, everything goes now. So what this is referring to is not getting stuck in emptiness as such. So it's referring again to that idea of doing the same thing to emptiness. I'm not just going to accept that as the whole truth. <clears throat> and then finally, we have um, non-retreat, imperturbability, etc. And the idea here is that doing these contemplative activities makes you feel uncomfortable. You put yourself in a position where there's not really an explanation about things to grasp onto anymore. And that's an uncomfortable position to be in. 
what do I believe about things? What are they, et cetera? Because the whole exercise is trying to break you out of even having statements about them to some degree. Well, the idea of non-retreat is that when you, when you feel that discomfort, instead of retreating from it, just keep pushing through it. Because when you push through it, you can essentially realize that even those fears and doubts themselves are more of these things that you're experiencing, conceptualizing, et cetera, and that they follow the same principles as all of the other dharmas. So you can actually push your way through them. But if you recoil from that sort of investigation, then instead you kind of leave yourself in a state of <laughs> existential dread, maybe would be a way to put it. So I know that's a lot. So here's a nice little summary. So Dharma Kishanti in general is based on removing the perception of the notion of patience or immovability itself as being something that's ultimately real. We have to understand that we engage to be able to create that situation of mental stability, of an unmoving mind, et cetera. It's not just something that we're going to grab someday. And that's what all these techniques were about. The other thing is that we want to remove the perception of uh, oneself as a separate self and then others as separate selves. So in other words, seeing all of these things as being related to each other, again, leads us into a state of more tranquility, immovability, mentally speaking. And then we should also keep in mind that the way that we conceptualize things, those conceptualizations are a way of perceiving reality, not the reality of the thing itself. They arose dependently. There was something out there, I was conscious of it, and through my perceptions, I developed a way of thinking about it. And then I'm taking that thing that I developed, the secondary category, and I'm treating it like it's what I was looking at in the first place. And then finally, we had talked before about these strategies of dealing with people who are hateful towards you, dealing with people who are very nice to you and not getting too attached to it. And that was Savik Shanti. And this chapter sort of ends with discussing the fact that Dharma Shanti is much more advanced and more difficult. If we start there, it's not an easy starting point. We live in the world of people, we relate to people, so that's very apparent to us, easy to work with. So if we start there, we'll eventually get to the practice of patience with respect to all phenomena by starting with people, a scale that we understand. But conversely, if you do start at this huge scale of thinking of all phenomena and developing patience with respect to them, that will also naturally lead you to patience with respect to other people. It's just the hard way. It's like challenge mode, I guess. Mm -hmm. So my, my, reflection, uh, my reflections on looking at this material are really that um, patience can be extended to all phenomena and not just to other people. And I think this is sort of an interesting, an interesting idea. <clears throat> So the term paramita, which is what's used for the perfections, so we're talking about shanti paramita. Paramita means to cross to the other shore. So when we're discussing practicing the perfections, and especially the perfection of shanti or patience, we're talking about really getting to its completion, which is why this got kind of off into the stratosphere, is it's like patient in every possible way, at every possible level. And so it's in a sense, that's, that's kind of overwhelming. But the idea is that the perfection of Kishanti is its extension to all spheres of our experience, mental, non-mental, dealing with other people, micro scale, macro scale, et cetera. So we should have strategies for all of them. And then I would just also like to bring up again that this notion that wisdom influences the actions that we take in the world. And conversely, our actions do influence uh, our wisdom or our mental states. And typically, we kind of think a lot about the activities of the body and mind as being separated, which is not really the case. They're in a relationship to each other, at least at some level. Um, I would argue a pretty strong one. So what we do changes how we think. How we think changes what we do. It's really as simple as that. So as we develop patience in one domain, that's going to necessarily influence the other domains. So when you work toward one, you're really working toward all of them. And the last point is that 
um, more than once they say you're on the Bodhisattva path. So do that. Keep that in mind. That allows you to do difficult things. And so that's my final reflection is that you're already a Bodhisattva, so start acting like one. Um, we're assured in the Lotus Sutra that we're all on the Bodhisattva path, regardless of where we're starting from right now. So this implies that no one is demanding that at this moment we be perfect. We're working toward perfection. That's why Bodhisattvas practice the six perfections. So we don't need to wait before we take action. Um, we don't need to wait to perfect ourselves before we take action because it's through taking that action in the first place that we're eventually able to perfect ourselves. So get started. <laughs> please, please be merciful with the questions. <laughs> um, but before we begin the questions, 